Um, hello, my name's David Stewart. Um, I work in London. I manage the Chemsex Support Services in London. My friend Leon asked me to make a little video just to explain the kind of the work that I've done here in London in regard to shifting Chemsex Support out of the traditional substance misuse setting or the addiction centre setting and into the sexual health setting and why that's been such a successful model here. Not uh, the perfect model for every city, uh, we have to be adaptive, but let me kind of explain why. So, um, a chemsex is one of those awkward things that fits, uh, it's got like one leg in the addictions field or the substance use field and it's got another foot very firmly placed in gay cultural stuff. So chemsex is the, um, most of the guys that we see uh, at where the place where I work using chems for sex, we see about 4,000 a month, so we see quite a lot of them. Um, they're not coming for support with the drug use specifically. They're coming to talk to us about challenges and difficulties they're having with grinder, hookup culture, gay sex, the concept of HIV in their community and in their own bedrooms, the concepts of um, the language and lingo and, and certain cultural things unique to gay culture and gay sex and hooking up and being single and feeling confident in bed and feeling sexy in bed and trying to do all of that sober. They're, they're the challenges that um, our our clients and patients are communicating to us. So they're not walking in saying, help me, this is a drug issue. They're walking in saying, help me with gay sex. So we heard them and we thought, how do we best create the, the kind of support services and the, the re what's the response for them? <sighs> to give a really good example of why I think this work is better done in places where gay men come to talk very easily and confidently about gay sex. Um, I work in a sexual health clinic which is visited by lots of gay men and we have the faith about, about gay community. Uh, around the corner from us there's a, a very good drug service, an addiction service, um, which does harm reduction and all the usual things. Um, they've had about four gay men visiting their service who use chems in the last two years. And only four minutes walk from them is us where we have 4,000 a month. And we've never used the word addiction, drug use support, or anything like that in any of our campaigns. All we've said is come and talk to us about the gay sex that you're having. One of the reasons I've been so passionate and advocate of this kind of care is because imagine, uh, imagine that this is a waiting room of a typical drug service and over here is, uh, I'm going to use stereotypes if you don't mind, um, a, a, heterosexual gay, a heterosexual male who is a street homeless heroin injector who would be HIV negative but hepatitis C positive. And in this setting, in this substance misuse setting, um, he's ticking every high risk box there is. Um, you know, the, the use of a, of a dependent drug, something that might have some withdrawal symptoms that might need some medicating. Um, he's street homeless, so there might be some sort of support around the homelessness that, uh, that he might need help with. There's the fact that he's hepatitis C positive and possibly sharing needles and the transmission of that. Um, he's going to be needing a lot of support and in regard to cost to public health, it might cost thousands of pounds to keep him engaged in care. He's in the right place, he's ticking all of the high risk boxes because that's our job, you know, to support people particularly with the high risks around these things. So sitting over here is um, a young gay man. So he's young, he's um, got a boyfriend, he's not street homeless, he owns his own home, he's got a great job. Um, he's not using any dependent daily drugs, he's only using once a month, or twice a month maybe, recreational drugs, chems. And um, he's HIV negative, hepatitis C negative, he's not committing any crimes to get his drugs, having a good time mostly, um, maybe wants a little bit of help. And in this setting, he can get some help, but he's not ticking a lot of the high risk boxes. Um, but, you know, staffing drug services are amazing, so, so they'll offer us some behaviour change support, I'm sure. But this guy, if he's sitting in a sexual health setting, think of the risk assessments that are, are standard. We know how many people in the city are HIV positive. We know how many gay men are HIV positive. So we can do the math of the risks of HIV acquisition. We're going to ask standard questions like, forgive me, how many penises have you had to be bummed without a condom? They're standard questions that staff ask very easily and normally in sexual health settings and gay men expect and kind of want us to ask those questions. Um, we know the prevalence of HIV within our population, so we know the risk. We know how many, for instance in London, one in every eight gay men is HIV positive, but 90% of those are uninfectious. We know what that means, so we know again how to comp work that into the math. We know how to check the risk assessment that 
if this guy walks out of our service and we didn't find out if there was a, a chance of him having become infected of HIV within the last three days, which gives us the opportunity to prescribe some PET, then we're doing him a great disservice. If he says, um, someone came in my eye and I'm not sure if they were HIV positive or not, we know what to do. We know what to do to make sure he doesn't come HIV positive. We know whether that's a risk or not. It's standard for us. If he's overdosing from GBL, which happens a lot, obviously, and often we think it's because they took too much of the drug, or they took the right amount of the drug but at the wrong time intervals, it's also possible that they're overdosing from G because it's interacting with perhaps HIV medicines they might be taking. We know the answer to our pharmacist teams in this setting know this. That might not be known so well in drug services. Also, we know that this guy's going to catch gonorrhea maybe three to seven times this year without our support. And we know how to do harm reduction information around gay sex to support him with that. We also know he's probably going to become HIV before the end of the year or two. And we know how, specifically how culturally how, to support him not to become HIV positive. Because if you consider, if he does become HIV positive, it could be months before we test him and find out and put him on treatment so he becomes uninfectious. In that time, he might infect between 30 to 60 more guys with that HIV, innocently, of course. The cost to public health is in the millions when you consider all of those onward infections. All of the most common risks associated with chemsex are things that are dealt with as standard in sexual health settings, and that's the right place for this group. Also, I have to mention the gay sex component of all of this. If you know what it's like to be lonely and horny on a Saturday night with a grinder on your phone and you know you're going to get lots of invitations to do chems even though you're trying not to. Do you know? Do we know how to support people with that, with the communication skills on there? Do we know what that feels like? The staff in sexual health services in, in England and in other parts of the world are very familiar with gay sex, so that's a very, very, very good place to start. The reason we have 4,000 people coming to see us is because we're doing the right risk assessments so we can do the right care. Um, and we understand gay culture. We understand bears versus otters and cubs and twinks and and the shaming, the camp shaming, the masculine shaming that happens online. We know what it's like to be um, a gorgeous Asian gay man that's very welcome at our gay pride marches, but he gets rejected on Grindr shamefully, racially, horribly, all the time. If that happens four times in a weekend, it really impacts him. If it happens every weekend for a year, seven years, he starts acting differently because he's getting messages about what he's worth. Kim's going to be part of it. We know how to address that too. Now, I know there are lots of brilliant staff in drug services and in other settings besides sexual health who know how to do all of this, and, and that's awesome. So it is really about finding the right people, the right disciplines, a multidisciplinary team that can be involved to, to supporting gay men in the right settings. But they're going to come to the places where they are most familiar talking about gay sex, where traditionally they have come to easily talk about gay sex. And usually in those settings, that's where we, as standard, do the best risk assessments for chemsex as well. I hope some of the stuff I've said is helpful. Um, I hope you're having a good training day. Uh, good luck, and, and I love you, Leon. I love you, everybody else. Bye-bye.